We're back into our look at the, the Apostle John's first epistle. We're in chapter number 5. Uh, we're about to enter into a, several verses here, a, a, a portion of his letter that uh, has uh, brought about much debate, that's for sure. Uh, we're going to start it off in verse number 16, that's where we left off. Verses 16, 17, and we'll probably surely get into ch uh, verse 18 as well. Verses 16 and 17 of 1 John chapter 5. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. Again, obviously, we have come to two verses in this letter that have brought about much commentary, much discussion. Okay, let's start off with what we know, which is the wages of sin is death. Okay, that we understand. The wages of sin is death. There was only one who was not deserving of death, and he suffered death for you and me. Other than that, the wages of sin is death. Nevertheless, here we are. You're alive and so am I. You're hearing my voice. So we're still alive, we're still breathing. Nevertheless, the wages of sin is death. So what could the apostle mean in our passage we just read? A sin not leading to death, and then saying a sin leading to death. Well, one place to start with, to even try and understand the passage, we have to start off with the term brother. Brother. If anyone sees his brother. So immediately, he's speaking about someone who is saved, born again, and recognized in the community of faith. So if anyone sees his brother, we could say, or sister, right? Right? brother or sister in the Lord, committing a sin not leading to death. All right, well, notice, before we start to get into that, a little bit later on in the passage we read, he refers to a sin which does lead to death. Now, John doesn't use the term brother there. So is John making a distinction between those who are saved and those who are not. All right, so you've heard me quote from Tony Evans, John MacArthur. I certainly respect those gentlemen. Uh, they've been a help to me, their commentaries. Uh, I want to share with you what each man said, because what each man said uh, is, for the most part, how these two verses are interpreted. Evans writes, There is a more serious kind of sin, though, a sin that leads to death. This is sin that results in the physical death of a believer. We see examples of this in Scripture when God takes unrepentant believers home before their time. These are typically gross sins against the body of Christ. In view here is not a believer struggling with sin. After all, the church is a hospital for sinners but a hard-headed fool who adopts a harsh, unloving attitude towards God's people. When someone wreaks havoc in the family of God, he may experience severe discipline from the Lord. John says, I am not saying that a believer walking with God should pray about that. Though he doesn't say we shouldn't pray in such cases, he is communicating that you cannot have confidence that God will answer such a prayer. Now that came from Evans. MacArthur pretty much goes along the same lines. He writes this, John illustrates praying according to God's will with the specific example of the quote-unquote sin leading to death. Such a sin could be any premeditated and unconfessed sin that causes the Lord to end a believer's life. It is not one particular sin like homosexuality or lying, but whatever sin is the final one in the tolerance of God. Failure to repent of and forsake sin may eventually lead to physical death as a judgment of God. 
No intercessory prayer will be effective for those who have committed such deliberate, high-handed sin. In other words, God's discipline with physical death is inevitable in such cases as he seeks to preserve the purity of his church. The contrast of the phrase, quote, there is sin leading to death, with there is sin not leading to death, signifies that the writer distinguishes between sins that may lead to physical death and those that do not. That is not to identify a certain kind of mortal or non-mortal sin, but to say not all sins are so judged by God. Okay, so with all due respect to Evans and MacArthur, okay, uh, they, for the most part, they, they take the same opinion on this. But here is, here's what you, I want you to consider. The Apostle thus far, and we're five, now we're five chapters into this, four full chapters, and we're into the fifth chapter of this letter. The Apostle John has not made any differentiations at all about sin in his epistle. At all. So, here's another question as we try to figure this out. Is this sin leading to death, the unpardonable sin, is an apostasy? Okay, let me give you a couple verses here that would justify that. Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. The writer says, For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and have been partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God, and put him to open shame. Now, we have discussed that passage before in previous lessons the author of Hebrews is making mention, is that, and, and this is where that the author is going, if someone attends a congregation, a church, they are not saved, and you've been there, and you've attended, and you go, you go every Sunday, you go every Shabbat, what have you, you have heard the message over and over, you have seen people, and how they live their lives, lives of righteousness. You have seen the Holy Spirit at work through those people. The fruits of the Spirit have been clearly seen in the believers that you have attended that congregation with. You have seen all of that, and you turn around and you walk away denying Yeshua. The author of Hebrews says, after all of that, there's no hope for you. Because you've been there. You've tasted it. It's not like a situation where someone never knew the gospel or heard it once or something. They're not really interested. No, you were actually there. You were attending that congregation. You were attending that church every single week, and you turn around and walk away. And the author is saying, there's simply no hope for you. There's no repentance there. Hebrews 10, verses 26 and 27. Same author, for if we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. So, there's some verses there that would certainly justify the question that I posed. How about this question? Because we still haven't figured out what John is, where John is going. But how, here's another question for you. Is the sin leading to death the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Some would believe it is. Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. But blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. That's Matthew, Mark's Gospel. Chapter 3, beginning verse 28. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, 
but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. That's Mark's gospel. How about Luke? Luke 12, verse 10, And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. <laughs> so, there, that's going along the same kind of lines as really what the author of Hebrews is saying. I mean, the Pharisees had seen the miracles, had actually seen the Holy Spirit working through Yeshua, and they turn around and say he has a demon. For someone to go and be so reckless to say something like that, that there, there, that's exactly what we're talking about. You, you, you look, you look. In other words, God in the eye, and you say, "I will not believe, I will not trust." So again, as I said when we started the, the this lesson off, I mean, you you may have more questions now than answers when we're looking at this these two verses, sixteen and seventeen. But how about this? What was verse fifteen? Right, that's. That's, that's what we need to look at. Verse 15, And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. So the synopsis should be this. We should be interceding on behalf of fellow believers who have fallen into sin. We should be. So you have someone who is truly saved. They are born again. And, but they've fallen into sin. They've fallen out of fellowship, we could say, sometimes. Or, so here's a good term, they've backslidden. All right. And I know exactly about that because that's my story. Where I was backslidden throughout practically all of my 20s. So there I am. I have everlasting life. I have the Holy Spirit in me. But was I walking in the light? No. No. Not at all. In fact, every time I stepped into a church, I felt convicted. Every time I heard the preaching, the teaching, I felt convicted. So, when a believer falls out of fellowship and falls into a life of sin, we as believers should be praying intercessory prayer for that believer. What do we want? We want that, we want that believer to confess their sins. We want that believer to repent of their sins. And then to have that person restored, restored into the fellowship with his Savior, restored to the fellowship of faith in whatever assembly or church they, they were attending. So John's epistle thus far has addressed those who were spreading Gnostic teachings. Remember, that's the whole purpose of the letter. You have these false teachers, who these tares that were in among the wheat, and these tares were preaching a false gospel. They were preaching and teaching believers Gnostic teachings. So these people were lost. Well, the next question should be, should we be interceding on behalf of those who are lost? Absolutely. Without question, we pray for the lost, that they would come to faith. We should be, so now you see, we should be praying for believers, all right, those who are walking in the light, Yes, remain in the light, be strengthened, right? We ought to be lifting up those believers who have fallen, who are perhaps backslidden, okay? That they be restored, that they once again walk in the light. And, and we also ought to be praying for the lost, those who are in darkness, those who have been deceived, right? We ought to be praying for all of them. And then for John's point, even the Gnostics, yes, yes that they would accept Yeshua as the, as the Savior. Tim Hegg writes, he says, Thus, John is not issuing a prohibition for intercessory prayer in a particular situation, but rather enjoins this upon us regardless of the circumstances. This means that even for those who have openly denied Yeshua, there still may be a time when they will repent and return to a walk of genuine faith in Yeshua, and it is this for which we should pray. Thus, what John is emphasizing is that in the case where someone has sinned by denying Yeshua, and who repents of the sin, then this is not a sin unto death. 
to pray for someone who is, who is denied Yeshua, yet they never repent, this is what identifies the sin as unto death. John's point, therefore, is this. When we pray for someone who is a true believer, even in a time when this person denies Yeshua, we will receive our request for his or her return, even as John states in verse 15, because of those who belong to Yeshua will never be eternally lost. Consider this in regard to Peter's denial of Yeshua. Before the denial even took place, Yeshua himself, fully aware that this would happen, states in Luke 22, verses 31 and 32, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. What did Yeshua say at that point? He already knew. Peter, you're saved, you belong to me. I know you're one of my sheep, but you're going to deny me. And in fact, you're going to deny before the rooster crows. You're going to go uh, twice. You're going to deny me three times. But in that passage, what does Yeshua say to him? I know you're coming back. I pray for you. You belong to me. And I know you're going to come back. And he says, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So Peter, I know you're coming back. And once you do... I want you to strengthen the brethren. But what, what would have happened had Peter not? Yes, he was saved. Yes, he denied the Lord on that night. What if he never did repent? Well, he's still saved. Head continues, here we see our Lord interceding for Peter, the outcome of which is Peter's repentance and return to his walk of faith in Yeshua. But we do not have the ability to know whether a confessed believer who denies Yeshua will be granted repentance and return, or will persist in their denial and unbelief. Should we then refrain from intercession on their behalf because we cannot be certain of their true heart condition? John's point in our text is no. For since we have no way of knowing if the person sinned in this instance is unto death or not, we must intercede in prayer for them. If they return in repentance and faith, then we know that their sin was not unto death. But if there is never any return, then we know that the reason we have not received our request is that the sin in which they are engaged in is in fact the sin unto death. Again, Yeshua knew that Peter was coming back. But he knew it. None of us would have known. So what John is saying is, you continue to pray, and you continue to pray, and yes, you pray for Peter, that he return. Well, obviously, Peter did, but what if he hadn't? Did he, does he lose his salvation? Well, of course not. Of course not. His name is written down. He has the Holy Spirit. Did he deny Yeshua? Yes. If he had died in that denial, yes, it's a sin which leads unto death. That's where John is going. So, again, there's just there's not going to be a consensus on the aforementioned explanation of, of, about prayer. All right, I get it, and probably when all is said and done, we'll have more questions than we'll have, we'll have answers. But we are to pray. We're to pray for believers who are walking in the light. We're to pray for believers who have stepped out of the light so they get back in the light. And we are to pray for the lost. We pray for everybody. There is one passage... Jeremiah 7, 16, where God specifically said, don't pray for somebody. Jeremiah 7, 16, as for you, Jeremiah, do not pray for this people, and do not lift up cry or prayer for them, and do not intercede with me, for I do not hear you. Now, keep in mind, that was a direct command from God to his prophet about a particular people in a given situation. That was a specific command given to him. There is no command like that for us. So if that's the case, we pray, and we pray, and we pray for the lost, and we pray for the saved, and we pray for everybody. So here is this, if I may, expanded paraphrase of verses 16 and 17. If anyone sees his brother, one who has confessed faith in Yeshua, 
who is currently not walking in ways of righteousness, but is sinning in a way that does not lead to eternal death, he should intercede in prayer to God for his brother, and God will bring him back to his, uh, to his faith and righteous living, which will be proof that he was not sinning unto death. Granted, there can be a circumstance where a person confesses faith in Yeshua, then denies him and never comes to repentance. This is not to prove that intercessory prayer is powerless, but rather that he was sinning the sin that leads to eternal death. But I'm not talking about that situation, for only God knows the heart. And since not all sin is that which marks a person as an apostate, never to be granted repentance, we must intercede in prayer for a confessed believer who is seen to be sinning. Because while all unrighteousness is sin, there is sin that does not eventuate in eternal death, but when the one sinning is granted repentance, that sin can be overcome, and such perseverance in the faith is the mark of every true believer. Hey, Peter came back. Yeshua knew he would come back. And the fact that he came back was proof positive that he was in the faith, that he was saved. The question is always going to remain, what had happened if Peter did not repent and he had died in that situation? Would people have looked at it and said, whoa, what was the man ever saved? We'll never know. Well, obviously God did. Now, watch how the apostle here, his thought process, leads us into the next verse. Because this is important as well. It's not just 16 and 17. Verse 18. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. So again, the true child of God, and Peter was the example of this, will confess, will repent of their sins, and they will return. David. David confessed. David repented. David was restored. Peter confessed. Peter repented. Peter was restored. Heg writes, the one who is born of God has been given the ability to overcome sin and to live in righteousness, gaining victory over the ways of the world. Thus, as John taught us in the previous verses, the brother or sister who is sinning is proven to be a genuine child of God when he or she repents, meaning turns from the sin and lives in victory over sin. So the one who is born again has received, as John has stated earlier in his letter, eternal life. Yes, we have eternal life, that's true, but we also have a new nature. And it was that new nature that was in me for all those years when I was out of fellowship and I was living really in, a, in an ungodly way. But it was that new nature, uh, it was God's Holy Spirit that was constantly convicting me. And that went on for years. For years. And I knew I, knew I was a child of God. Why am I acting like this? Why am I behaving like this? And I was miserable. 1 John 3, 6, No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. <laughs> and that should be, no one, who, no one who's in him sins, sins comfortably. No, no. There's no such thing as a believer who sins comfortably. <laughs> That's for sure. And there's no such biblical concept uh, as sinless perfectionism either. Okay? Not, not, not this side of glory. Galatians 5.17, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. There you have it. There is a war, and it's going on inside of you. And it is your flesh, your old sin nature, and his Holy Spirit at b in doing battle. So the spirit in cooperation with God's word, is showing you this is what you should do, and your flesh is going, nope, I want to do something different. Our lives must exhibit victory over sin. Our lives should never be characterized by sin. Never characterized by sin. And it's sad, I'm sad to say, I look back and I wonder how many people, when they saw me for all those years, 
they never considered me a believer. And I was. So keep in mind, when, when God tells Cain, hey, sin is crouching at your door. Cain, what, what do you expect? You can just ignore it? If, it, if sin is crouching at your door, sin's not going away. It's going to continue to crouch until you open the door and you deal with it. You have to open that door and you have to crucify it. You just can't ignore it. Sin will continue to crouch. And that's exactly what happened. Cain never dealt with it. And you know what happened? He slew his brother. All right, now we come to... Here's an, another phrase that can be perplexing, and it can be perplexing depending on what translation of the Bible you're looking at. But he who was born of God keeps him. Now, I'm reading from a New American Standard where the he is capitalized and the him is not. But if not for the capitalization, how would you interpret this? Now, if you're looking at a King James Version, it reads like this. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. Well, that's strange, because how can I keep myself? In fact, I can't. There's no possible way. New King James, but he who has been born of God keeps himself. Well, no, it's actually the Lord that's holding on to me, not me myself. But listen to the New Living Translation. Not exactly the best version out there, but... For God's Son holds them securely. That's excellent. For God's Son holds them securely. The Net Bible, but God protects the one he has fathered. So the weight of the evidence thus far, and what we see in the scriptures themselves, but Yeshua, who is God's only begotten Son, keeps the believer secure. John 17, verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. And so that leads into our next uh, phrase right there. He who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. Of course, referring to the devil, right? Can a believer, question, uh, because it's batted around in a no number of churches, can a believer ever, ever become demon-possessed? Well, if there was ever a verse in the Bible that, t that can clearly tell you no, it would be this one. And the evil one does not touch him. Touch. Apto. Apto. It means to fasten to, to grasp onto, to lay hold of. So, a believer cannot cannot, cannot be demon-possessed. It's impossible. But, if you open the door to wickedness, if you decide to not walk in the light, it's not as if a demon can possess you, but trust me, they will bring hell on earth to you. And you welcomed it by not walking in the light. They can't possess you, but they can bring hell to you. 1 John 4.4 4, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You cannot be possessed. It's impossible. MacArthur writes, Because the believer belongs to God, Satan must operate within God's sovereignty and cannot function beyond what God allows. While Satan may persecute, tempt, test, accuse the believer, God protects his children and places definite limits on Satan's influence or power. Well said. John chapter 10, verse 28, And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one. <laughs> they will never perish. Your name has been written down. You have everlasting life, and you're not going anywhere. You belong to him. He died for you. He saved you. He has put a new nature in you. He has put his spirit in you. And that spirit is your guarantee that you are his forever. So the evil one, trust me, is a formidable foe. The evil one is far more powerful than us, far more intellectual than us, 
we should and we must put on the full armor of God in order to confront the evil one. But the evil one has been defeated. The evil one was defeated 2,000 years ago at Calvary. Yeshua died and he walked out of that tomb, a resurrected body. In other words, Satan is powerless against us unless you open the door to him. And again, that world will bring hell to you. Final words from Haig. John's point is clear. Because we are kept by Yeshua himself, regardless of what we may face in our lives upon this earth, we will never be defeated by the evil one. He has already lost the battle, and we who are in Yeshua have the victory secured through the power and life of our Redeemer. When Noah and his family went into that ark and God closed that door, Noah and his family were secure. The flood waters and everything else that was going on outside that ark could not touch them. It was impossible. And that is how secure we are in Yeshua. Nothing can touch us. Nothing. We have completed uh, verse number 18. When we gather back together again, uh, we'll complete not only chapter 5, but uh, that will be the end of the first epistle of John.